Hey, what's up? Hello, it's Katie, and we're here to do things a little bit different today. How are we flipping the script? Okay, so for the past, like, what, nine months, however long I've had this channel, I have been doing monthly wrap-ups. But the problem is I've been reading anywhere from, like, 15 to, like, 23 books a month and it's just so chaotic to film a wrap-up at the end of the month because it's like one the videos are so long it's so many books to talk about i can only talk about each of them for like 30 seconds to a minute that's not enough time sometimes i have way more feelings than that or i'm just completely dismissing books and not getting to like the point and also the book that i read at the beginning of the month at the end of the month so many books have passed since then and maybe i'm just like not even really remembering the books that well at the end so you're not really getting a good review or judgment or opinion of them and I just don't like that and it's just so daunting to have to film the end of the month so I thought to myself maybe I should do a recent read like maybe um a video for the first half of the month and the second half of the month or for every five books I've read now hilariously I've been in a little bit of like an unmotivated mood or schlumpy you know a little reading schlump so I've only read five books so far this month and we are at like I think it's like May 16th or 17th it's something like that I don't know but I thought I wanted to let you guys um have an opinion on this I want you to tell me what you think should I do like every five books should I do like beginning of the month end of the month or should I just stick to doing monthly wrap-ups I don't know I want to hear from you let me know one of the reasons I've been in a reading slump is one the books I've been reading because half of them have just been meh and the other half have been like how am I supposed to read another book after that and then also I just watched Shadow and Bone. I have not watched a TV show. Let me put this into perspective. When I say that I haven't watched TV in a long time, I'm dead ass. I have not watched a TV show since Tiger King. And the show I watched before that was the last season of House of Cards. I have not watched TV. Okay, I want to, but I cannot get my ass to sit down and focus. But Shadow and Bone, phenomenal, phenomenal. Oh my God. Like, you all know, you saw the vlogs, okay? I read the trilogy and I freaking hated it. I hated it, hated it, terrible. Two stars all around, so bad. The show, five stars, 10 stars, shooting into the sun. It's stunning, oh my God. Like, I got Grace to watch it. She watched the entire thing in like one day, I think. Yeah, she watched the whole entire thing in one day and she's never read the books. And she was like, I want to read Six of Crows. I was like, yes! Like, oh my God, I'm obsessed. Anywho, that's why I haven't been doing a lot recently because I'm like, yeah, no book is going to stand up to as good as the show is right now. It's just not going to happen. Okay. Anyway, the other thing I wanted to say before we get into this video is that it is uh, my birthday coming up. It is um, June 14th is my birthday <laughs> flag day. Nobody cares, but it is also national bourbon day, which is pretty sick. But I want to do something for my birthday. I want to do like some sort of dedicated video and I want to ask you guys what you want to see. So if you either want to comment down below what you think I should do for my birthday or maybe um, follow me on Instagram and you can DM me on there. It'll be linked down below. That'll be super cool as well. But other than that and the longest intro of all time, let's get to the five books that I've read so far in May. The first of which being The Death of Vivek Oji by Akweke Emese. So this book opens up in Nigeria with a mother opening her front door and finding her child's body dead at her feet. This is in part about self-discovery, but much more than that, it is about other people discovering who you are and loving you despite knowing who you are. So maybe people understanding that they have never understood you, that they never will, but they love you despite that. And it is so deep. It's so beautiful. It's about masculinity. It's about femininity. It's about family. It's about friendship. It's about love. It's about sisterhood. It's about understanding, about the discovery, like self-discovery, about trying to figure out who you are, trying Trying to figure out who other people are it is so so deep and it is something that so needed to be written and needed to be said and needs to be read i know objectively that this book is five stars it is five stars in the way it is written it is five stars in the way that it needed to be said but i am going to give this four stars it did not have the extra push to give it five stars in my opinion and i do believe that is the expectation i went into this book with Everybody kept saying that this was such a five star. It's one of the best books they've ever read and it made them sob. I never cried reading this book. Like I teared up, but I went into this with way too high of expectations. And this is a lesson to be learned. And when people say that a book made them sob, the next person who reads it after hearing that is not going to get the emotional impact 
that the person who was recommending it did because you're going into it expecting something. So like, I hate that because I love hearing about when people say that books made them cry. <sighs> Maybe if I had not had that expectation going into it, I would have liked it more. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what to say. This is four stars. It's a five star book, but I got a four star emotional ride out of it. I had a four star experience from a five star book. Does that make sense? This is definitely a book that I believe you should know as little as possible going into it. Um, this is something that you definitely don't want to go into one, as I said, with expectations, but also knowing anything. And I feel like I might have already said too much, but definitely read it. It's very short. I think that the um, audiobook is very, very good. I'm glad that Gabby suggested the audiobook, the narration, the um, accents and such in the book and its own voices with the uh not only the writer but the narrator and I absolutely adored that I think it was very beautiful and I do highly recommend it the next book we have is Honey Girl by Morgan Rogers look at this cover for a second look at this cover are you freaking kidding me it's stunning it's stunning at the meal the cover is five stars the book was three stars there was a lot uh, there was things I liked about it but there's a lot of things I didn't like about it but it was fun it was fast it was cute. It was fine. I honestly feel like it was probably more of a two star, but like, I think I'm being really judgmental. This is the two and a half. It's a two and a half star. Okay. I can't fault it for being fun and cute, but there are a lot of things that I had a lot of dilemmas about. What is it about? It's about a girl named Grace Porter. Do you think you're ever going to forget her name? You won't because they literally say her full name every single sentence, all the time. Oh my God. She is rivaling Hazel Grace and The Fault in Our Stars with how often they say this girl's name. Like, good God. It was just Grace Porter, Miss Porter, Grace Porter this, Grace Porter, why are you doing that? I was like, is this new adult? Because it doesn't feel like it. Anyway, we're following our girl, Grace Porter. She just got her PhD in astronomy, but she gets rejected from the job that she's been working so, so many years to get. She has a very regimented life plan. She's very strict and her military father is very strict and she's trying to follow along this like step-by-step -step plan. So when she gets rejected, she doesn't know what to do now. She's like rock hard place. I don't know what to do. I didn't have another plan. So what she does is she books it to Vegas, gets blackout wasted and marries a girl, Yuki Yamamoto, that she's never met before. <laughs> what? So when she wakes up, she goes back to her life and she's like, I don't want this life anymore. What do I do? So she has to decide whether she's going to go back to this regimented life and try to figure her shit out or if she's going to embark on a new life and a romantic adventure with this total stranger. The thing that I liked most about this book is the dilemmas that Grace deals with, with being black in the workplace. Now, this is an own voice of story. The author is black and I felt like she was really portraying her own, like she was projecting her own struggles in the workplace through Grace. And of course, I am not a black woman in the workplace, so I cannot speak on it. But of my limited view, I felt like the portrayal was very good. I felt like the depiction was very good. I really love to see it. And the whole conversation about how black women have to work so hard and have to be perfect just to be sat at the same table as their white colleagues who are doing half the work and are half as good as them. Because Grace was basically like, I have to be absolutely perfect. I have to work just triple as hard and do everything top notch because if I make one mistake, nobody's gonna focus on anything else but my mistake. And I have to be nice, I have to be kind. I can never be angry or I'm gonna be like the angry black girl. And I really, really loved that part of the story. But now let's get into the things that I didn't like because honestly, that was kind of the end of the list of the things that I liked. One of the things I didn't like was speaking of the portrayal of racial injustice and racial prejudice in the workplace, Yuki Yamamoto is an Asian woman and I did not understand why she did not feel the same way or like, well, the thing is maybe she did, but her character had no development. Like she was such a back burner character. She was such a sideline character. Like I swear to God, she meant nothing to the story other than to get our main character out of her life slump. Like it, she literally didn't matter. Anyway, her being Asian, Sorry if you can hear the freaking trash truck, dump truck. What am I saying? Anyway, the trash mobile that's going by. Anywho, her being Asian was never brought up. It, it was barely spoken of. She never seemed like she had any racial injustice that was going on to her, which I know she did, but it was not spoken of. But it was spoken of so heavily with Grace that I was like, what? Like, but this girl's Asian. 
Anyway, the biggest gripe that I have of this book, other than that it wasn't a romance, period, we'll get to that in a second, is that it read very YA. This is supposed to be new adult. It read like they were like 16 or 17 years old, but they're supposed to be 28 and 29. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. It read so, so YA, especially Yuki's radio show. Did Yuki's radio show sound familiar? Did it sound familiar? She begins every radio um, episode with like, is anybody out there? Are you listening? Is anybody hearing me? Does that sound familiar? Well, it freaking should because that's like a direct ripoff. I'm sorry if it's not, but to me, it felt like it was. It felt like a direct ripoff of Aled's... Um, podcast in radio silence which i felt like the podcast in radio silence was so much better than this like so much better and also he's in high school okay like he's in high school it makes sense for him to be like all emotional and he's so emo or whatever and it was so good and i loved it yuki i was like no this just read so immature and like it read like tumblr poetry it read like tumblr inspiration poets where they just have the quotes over the photos that are like when you stare into the darkness and it stares back. I was like, Yuki, Yuki, girl, you're 28. Girl, stop, what are you doing? Anyway, I didn't like that. I did not like that I was like, this has been done so much better. And I'm sure it wasn't, but also I'm sure it was a direct ripoff of Radio Silence. Speaking of Yuki, I know I mentioned this earlier, but she literally was not a main character. She's not a main character. Not only did she never get any character arc, she never grew as a character. She stayed the exact same from beginning to end. Her character was never flushed out. We never really understood anything about her other than she was like Asian and cute and kind of like quirky. Like that was it. And I'm like, okay, but this is supposed to be a romance. And like, that's the other thing is that it's not a romance. It's not. If this had been marketed as a contemporary fiction, I would have given it three and a half stars, honestly, because Grace's character arc was good. It was good, but like, it wasn't a romance. And also it's not steamy at all. This is supposed to be an adult romance. Absolutely not. There's, I don't think this is a spoiler by telling you it's not steamy, but it's not steamy. There's like one sex scene and they kiss like twice. That's it. That's it. And I was like, listen, I didn't want sex scenes because my best friend's name's Grace and that would have been awkward. But I was also like, as a book, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like, like why a romances would have more steam than this? I'm being so judgmental. Anyway, also Yuki not being a main character, Grace's parents were way more of a main character than Yuki and her friends were definitely way more of a main character. Like they were in the book so much more. They meant so much more. So, so much more. It was literally just her friends and her parents were like the driving force of the book. And then Yuki was the driving force of the plot. And she literally is barely in the book. Like she just pops up. It's just Grace thinking about her and being like, oh yeah, my girl. And I'm like, your girl, where is she though? What? And almost all their interaction is just them talking on the phone. I'm really selling my almost three star rating. Like the way I'm talking about it is like it's a one star, but it's not. I felt completely underwhelmed. I'm talking myself into giving it a two. I'm not going to do that. It's a two and a half. I'm just shitting on this book so much. If it was a contemporary fiction, it would have made so much more sense. The marketing, poor, bad. Let's move on. Katie, let's move on. The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. Let me just take a moment. This book. I know you're all wondering if you haven't read it. The hype is real. I'm here to solidify that for you real quick. Okay, listen to me. Katie Coulson looking you dead in the eye and telling you that the hype is real. Okay, this is a four and a half star for me. Absolutely stunning. I was so worried and I bought this in December of 2020 and have not read it, have put it on my TBR every single month since and have it picked it up because the expectation was so intense for this book and it, mm, it held up. It held up up everything that people said about it was completely accurate like I felt everything that people said and more and that doesn't usually happen with high expectations so good god I'm freaking obsessed and like Sean and McGuire blurbed this and I really do think this has very Sean and McGuire vibes so if you love Sean and McGuire and you love the Every Heart of Doorway series um if you took that series but made it very cute and like very middle grade it would be this book. So cute. And then also make it a gay love story. What's up? We love to see it. I am freaking obsessed. I really don't believe that you could give this less than three stars. Like, I don't think so. I think that if you read this, I would be shook if you gave it lower than four stars. Like, 
truly shook because this book is so close to perfect. It is so close to being an absolutely perfect, perfect literary masterpiece. There's just not a fault to be seen. There's not a single fault to be seen in this book. This is about Linus Baker, who is a caseworker for magical children, where his job is to go and check up on orphanages to make sure that the children are getting fed, that they're getting um, taught properly, treated properly, and that the housing and all the conditions are up to par. Now he's very regimented, very strict, very rule following. And because of that, he gets called upon by extremely upper management to go and check on this orphanage that houses the most dangerous children. Okay, one of which is the Antichrist. Let that settle in for a second because you're not going to be able to handle the next kid who's a blob. Literally, he's just a blob who wants to be a bellhop and he's like the heart and soul of me. He owns my entire heart. Another character is a dragon and then another character, when he gets scared, turns into a Pomeranian. Like, I don't think I even need to say anything else. Like, are you already sold? Oh my god. And then... Arthur and Linus. Arthur's a caretaker and Linus have a freaking gay love story and it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. I love this book with my whole heart. My heart went out to every single one of the characters. I adored them. I think Chauncey is my favorite. I don't know. Chauncey, Linus, and Lucy are my favorite characters. I also really love Talia. Obviously we love Arthur. Um, I loved Helen. I just love all of them. They're all amazing. Like there was not a single character in this book that I did not fall head over heels for. It's so beautiful. It's so about like acceptance. And it is one of those like it's a fantasy, but it's using fantasy as a guise to talk about like racial issues and um, sexual identity issues and stuff like that, that people have to deal with in the everyday life. And it's done so miraculously. And there's also a lot of talk about like body shaming because Linus, our main character, is a little overweight or is a lot overweight. It's kind of hard to tell because you're in his head and he thinks he's a lot overweight. And then there's a character, um, Talia, who's a gnome who obviously is round and she's all like, she looks at him and is like, oh my god, you're like me. And he's like, what? No, I'm not. And she's like, yeah, you are. And it's so beautiful because she is surrounded by all these skinny people and she's like, oh my god, we're alike. Like, I didn't know anybody else like me existed. And he's like, learns to accept himself through her and it's so fun. Linus Baker is one of my favorite main characters I've ever read and that's due to so many reasons but the main reason is because he's definitely a six like he's a type six if you know the Enneagram this guy is such a type six it's freaking insane and he's also a counterphobic six at least he grows into being a counterphobic six toward the end of the book and I'm a counterphobic six and I never see that represented like anywhere so reading this I was just like oh my god I freaking loved him like he's a little frustrating but in like the most lovable ways and I just couldn't get enough read this book then I finished out the series for the Athena Club first of which being The Strange Case of Alchemist Daughter by Theodora Goss then there is a European Travel for the Monstrous Gentlewoman and the third book which I read this month is The Sinister Mystery of the Mesmerizing Girl this is the final book maybe like is it like theodore goss hello what do i need to do she wrote on twitter that she was like oh well the publisher bought three but i'd be willing to write more and i'm like how do i become a publisher how do i what do i need to do like theodore goss do you want to talk and i'll write do you want me to like edit do you want me to illustrate like what do you want me to do i will do it like who do i need to blackmail okay like hello i'm carrie washington who do i need to like full-on scandal to make this happen because i'm not i'm in denial i'm in denial i'm in denial i need another book i need another book meg from meg with books i can't thank you enough for talking me in to reading this series she talked about this book and she's the first person I've ever heard talk about The Strange Case of Alchemist's Daughter. And even to this day, I do feel like her and I are the only people that talk about it. And it's so good. Now, oh no, no, Olivia loves it too. It's so good. And I'm willing to die with this ship. I am willing to sail this ship and drag all of your bodies onto it to read it. It's like the Diviners, okay? They have very similar vibes, all right? And I'm obsessed with both of them. I know you've already heard me talk about The Strange Case of Alchemist's Daughter. If you've been on the channel for even a hot, like not even a hot second, a cold second, you already know what these books are about. So I'm going to try to be very brief. I say that every time. Just skip ahead 20 seconds if you don't want to hear it. This is about a group of monstrous women that have become monstrous in some way due to their mad scientist fathers doing experiments on them. So we have daughters of like Jekyll, Hyde, Moreau, Rappuccini, Frankenstein, 
um, Van Helsing, just a lot of different people. So, or Dracula, things like that. You've got all these different girls and they've come together to solve crimes with Sherlock Holmes and Watson across Europe while also trying to save other women from, or girls. They're like between um, like 14 to like 21 years old. So it's kind of like YA, but on the verge of like being older YA, which I really love. But they're also trying to make sure that other girls do not get experimented on. And the experiments are part of this group called the Alchemical Society, where these scientists and basically like <clears throat> stupid white men are experimenting on women because they think women are lesser than and nobody's going to pay attention to them. And they're just objects or whatever, blah, blah, blah. I hate men the most. Anywho, this one specifically is about... Alice, their housemaid, and then Sherlock Holmes went missing in the last book and the second book. And this is them trying to find them. Okay, here's the thing. I know I just hyped this up so much. I gave this three and a half stars. I'm giving this three and a half stars. I went into this with such high expectations. It's the last book in a series that is so beloved by me. I am freaking obsessed with this series. And I do think that if I read it again, I would give it four stars are hopefully higher than that, but I did not think this was nearly as good as the other two. One second, let me show you real quick something that was so astonishingly insane to me. This second book, 708 pages. Third book, 430 pages. Why is this 300 pages less than this? That's a rude, it's rude, it's an insult, I can't handle it. Anyway, this one, the other two books are so steeped in gothic literature, like it's about Frankenstein and Dracula and like, Sherlock Holmes and shit like you know what I'm saying it's such gothic literature and this book is following like Pan like the Greek god and Egyptian goddesses and not only did I have like no idea what they were talking about but I also didn't understand how it had anything to do with what was happening in the first and second book like I just felt like we were so incredibly detached from the storylines of the main characters and also the storyline of the tone of the series, which is gothic literature. Like the first two books, it feels like Morticia Adams is reading you a bedtime story. And in this, it was like Morticia Adams got up and walked away and then like Cleopatra sat down and went telling you a story, which sounds great. And I'm sure it is, but like, I, I wanted the Morticia Adams vibes. You know what I'm saying? I wanted that. And I didn't really get it in this. I also don't care that much about Alice, like the housemaid. She's great, don't get me wrong. So sweet, she's an angel but she doesn't have intrigue. Like there's nothing about her that is interesting me enough to like care about her story. And I did really love the Sherlock Holmes story in this. Um, Moriarty's in this book, love to see it, amazing. I went into this thinking because her name was Alice, this was gonna be an Alice in Wonderland story. It's not, don't think that. It is not, period, not even a little bit. Um, it's good, the book is good but it was not even close to the five-star feeling that I got in the first two books. Speaking of series, this brings me to a very interesting question that I wanna pose, and that's what's wrong with me? What's my freaking problem with series? I don't understand me and series relationships, and I think it's because of my expectations. Like, it has to just solely be based on my expectations because I only have two different modes with series, and it's if I give the first book three stars, I'll give the last book five stars, and if I give the first book five stars, the last book will be three stars. Like, it happens every freaking time. Let me give you a couple examples. So you just saw with the Athena Club, first two books, five stars. Last book, three and a half stars because my expectation was not met. Another example, the Villains series, which shouldn't be a series, by Victoria Schwab. First book, Vicious, five stars. Second book, Vengeful, two stars. Like what, what? You could, no, you did not meet that. Not even a little bit. Like you just, mm, 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 no. The only one that didn't do that was the Shades of Magic series by Victoria Schwab, which I believe I gave all of them like a four and a half or five star. So that's the one exception. Another series would be The Diviners. And you already know what I'm gonna say. First book, five stars. Second book, four stars. Third book, five stars. Fourth book, two stars. Hated it. Oh my God, didn't live up to a single expectation. Took my expectations, blew them to smithereens, blew them in my face and was like, did you think? <laughs> nice try. What? And then another glaring example on the flip side is when I read Akatar. So Akatar, I gave three stars. And then I reread it a couple months later and gave it three and a half stars. I was like, this is good. It's fine. This is good. It's just a good, fun time. Love it. Okay. But don't really care that much. 
read the second book just based on like TikTok hype, gave it four stars. I was like, this is so much better than that book, but I'm still not willing to say that it's like a great book, okay? But I was like, I'm still really here for it. Third book, I gave four and a half stars because I was like, I care, I care, I'm so invested. I'm so invested in these characters. Like I cried reading that book. I laughed out loud reading that book. I read like the entire thing in like one day and that book is like freaking ginormous. And I think that my expectations were so like superseded. Like they, they just went so beyond my expectations that I felt that I could not give it anything lower than a four star. Like in my opinion, if I start a series and I'm not invested and I don't really care that much, but if I find myself at the end of the series and the author made me stick around, like I'm still there by book three, at the end of book three, I'm still having fun. You deserve five stars. You deserve five stars. Okay. The author, you did it. You had me. You got me. God bless. Okay. That moves us into the last book that I read for May. And that is The Burning God by R.F. Kuang, which is the third book in the Poppy War trilogy. This series is set in ancient China, though in the books it is called Nikon. And in the first book we're following our main character, Ren, and she tests into the super elite military program called Synagard. And it's the only school that you can go to where you don't have to pay to get in. And she is super broke. She's from the South. She has a dark complexion. And when she gets in, everyone is not only surprised, but like hates her. And it's all like a racial injustice thing. It's all about ethnicity because they're all super pale and she has a dark complexion and she stands out amongst them. And they think that she's like lower. She's base. She's trash. She shouldn't be there. So in the first book, we are following her training and learning at the school and then starting to learn about shamanism, which is communing with the gods, which she might have more to do with than she would have previously expected. And that's where the fantasy comes in. And in the first book, we are following the Japanese Second Sino War or the Opium War or the Poppy War. Now, the second book, The Dragon Republic, is going into the Chinese Civil War, where it's the South versus the North. That is all of the second book. And in the third book, we are also dealing with the second half of that war, the fallout of war and the reforming like the political structure of Nikon or China after the war and how they're going to rebuild their society. Now, this is very intense because when she's at Synagogue, she's there for years and years and you follow her through all these years um, learning to be like at least a little bit accepted or respected by her fellow classmates. And then when the civil war breaks out, she's one of the only Southerners and she's surrounded by a bunch of Northerners. And now she's all of a sudden having to battle against her classmates and her friends and like kill people that she went to, is going to school with and that she was just having lessons with. It's very intense. It is one of the best depictions of war it's probably the de de best depiction of war that I have ever read. I don't know if it's the best out there, but I can say it's the best I've ever read. And I know that a lot of people like tout it as being the best they've ever read. So I think that I can, I can be sure, like I can highly recommend that. I think it is so brutal that like, don't go into it blind. If you're very squeamish, if you're very sensitive, I don't know if you can handle it. The raw, absolutely brutal, savage, depiction of some of the horrendous things that happen in war. And I don't just mean death. I don't mean guns. And I don't just even mean knives. I mean, um, starvation. I mean, like freezing to death. I mean, um, dying of dehydration or, um, just like, like all these insane things that happened, uh, being burned to death, um, being raped, being drowned, like these horrific things that happen to these characters. I can't even begin to describe and I won't, but I will tell you that all those kind of things happen because you need to know that going in in case you can't handle it. There is a lot of trigger warnings, um, especially for assault and especially for violence. Um, it's war. You're not going to get around it. Um, I do think that if you really love Game of Thrones, the book or the show, this has very Game of Thrones vibes. But if it was all in three books and you weren't waiting like your entire life to get another book, read these. Like if you love Game of Thrones, you will love this series. Like I'm dead ass. Also, I know what you're thinking. Because of all that stuff I said about series, you're probably thinking, oh my God, she gave the first book because it's the Poppy War. She gave it five stars. And then she's gonna give the Burning God two stars. Wrong, reverse, reverse. No, I gave the Poppy War three stars. I, I gave it three and a half. It's good, but I didn't connect. I didn't, I was not really in verse with 
RF Kuang's writing at that point. I didn't understand her tone. I didn't feel connected to the characters. I didn't understand the story. It was all happening so quickly and it was too intelligent. I just like could not wrap my brain around it. And I was not emotionally invested. Now the second book I gave four stars. The Burning God, five stars. Five stars. Oh my God. This is one of the most well-crafted works of literature I have ever read in my entire life. She is a genius. R.F. Kuang is a genius. And where I felt like it was emotionally lacking for me, I was not invested emotionally in the first book. And then I got a little bit more, I guess, in the second book. I found out that I should not have been looking at it that way because in the third book, in The Burning God, I was so insanely intellectually invested in this book. It is one of the most intelligent things I've ever read. Like if you like the secret history with that, like, I mean, obviously it's not like the secret history, but like the amount of like intelligence that it takes to read that book, this book, I believe that I could read this and read this and read this like over and over again and still be surprised by things that happen in it. Sorry, how rude, my camera turned off and I don't know exactly where I was, but I think what I was about to say was, the strategy, the strategy. Oh my God, the strategy, the battle strategy. Like Tywin Lannister could never. Tywin Lannister, did he write this book? Like R.F. Kuang is a genius, he's a genius. This, the things the characters do, the war moves, the maneuvers that they make against their enemy to shift alliances and to disrupt and unsettle the other side so they can get a leg up are top tier. Absolutely top notch. Like this, I had such a book boner for the intelligence of this book. I was every freaking sentence. I was like, what? Oh my God. And the thing is the stuff they do is so messed up. It's a war and RF Kuang never forgets it. She never forgets it. It's a war sis. And we are not effing around. And the characters want to win more than they want to be good. There are things they do that dead ass they will have um, a dozen or a hundred or a thousand people just wiped out murdered they, like have a whole city burned to the ground have a whole city drowned um have like a freaking like not a plague but like poison a bunch of people's water supply or drop a bomb or do this or that and they're just like yeah and they don't even feel bad about it and i swear to god like that's what another thing that makes her so good is that the gray character no one has ever written a gray character with so much development as rf kwan fang renin is the best great character I've ever read in my life. I thought that Victor Vale had the crown, but he has been usurped, usurped by Rin. You can't love her. You can't, but you can't hate her. It's very complex. Like she, it's like Rin is that bitch. You know, Rin's that bitch. She been that bitch. She always gonna be that bitch. But she's also just like a bitch. You know what I'm saying? Like. You want her to win. You've been with her. You want her to win. But then you're also like, you can't win. You're like crazy. Like, oh no. Is she a hero? Is she a villain? You won't know. You can't even decide. You are not going to know. You're not, you're not going to know if she's a villain or a hero. You're never going to get a full view of it. You're just like, she's so complex and people are so complex and they're so complex in war. And I swear to God, I think that the reason why so many people were crying in this book, like I didn't cry in this book at all. But I was like, <gasps> so much of the time because I think that the horrible things the characters do to win is what made people cry because there's so much death and destru destruction and mutilation that people were like, oh my God, that's so horrible. And I was reading it and I was like, they're a genius. They're a genius because I'm like, it's going to work. Yeah, what they're doing is horrifying, but they're going to win. And I'm like, it's so good. It's so good. It was very like, you know, like House of Cards when he would like do something and you're like, that's terrible, but damn, he's right. It's gonna work. It was very much like that. I freaking loved it. Um, I loved reading about all the characters, but I didn't love the characters because they're just not, they're great. They're not like super great people, but you kind of like love them anyway. Like Katai is the only like cinnamon roll. He's a cinnamon roll, precious, love him. Venka is my favorite character. Like I really, yeah, Venka is the favorite character. She is so that bitch, like I freaking loved her. And I loved the ambiguity with her character in this book and the ambiguity um, toward the end of like, we really don't know what to believe. And I loved that. And I also was thinking about each scenario of how, like what happens in her storyline. And I was like, even if this was true or this was true or this was true, like all three of the suspects of what could be going on, 
I loved all of them and I understood all of them. And I was like, I'm going to reread the series and just be focusing so much on Venka and trying to figure out what the fuck was happening. Alton was human garbage. I, I mean, he was garbage. Um, Neja, I hate him and you can't talk me out of it. Honestly, try. Please try because Grace loves him and I think Neja is literal human filth. I hate Neja. I hate him. He's gross. He's disgusting. Can't stand him. Get out of my face. You sicko. Daji loved her. Jung didn't like him in the first book, loved him in the third book. Uh, who else? I think that's it. Anyway, this book is stunning. It is so intellectually sound. The characters are so well done. I cannot believe that this is a debut novel. This is a debut series. R.F. Kuang needs to come out with his next book, Babel, which is Dark Academia. Did you hear that? Yeah, <laughs> I said that. She needs to come out with it immediately because I need more shit from this author. I need it, okay? And I also need this series physically. I need to own it. Uh, I hope I get it soon because I am so obsessed and then I'll reread it and like tab in it because it's so good. Like the hype is real. Read the series in the list. That's the end of the five books that I read this month. And as it turns out, the videos are going to be just as long, if not longer, but I get time to rant and rave about all the books. And like, that's what you're here for, right? You're not here to just hear me say, I read 23 books. It's like, yeah, but what did you read and what did you feel about them? Hello. So that's what we're doing right now. Let me know if you enjoyed it, if you want to see me keep doing this, or if you want me to do these and then also do a wrap up. I don't know. But if you've gotten this far into the video, what emoji should we do? We should do the house emoji. Do the house emoji for the house in the Cerulean Sea. That would be super cute. So leave that if you're not sure what to comment or if you've just gotten this far into the video. I would love to see if you have. So leave that comment down below. Also, let me know what you want to see me do for my birthday in June. And then uh, I also have my Goodreads and my Instagram linked down below. If you want to follow me, I would just love that. That would be amazing. And I'm going to see you in a video coming very soon. Thank you. Have an amazing day, evening, night, whatever you're having. Have a good one. And I'll see you next time. Bye.